Photography has been around for hundreds of years, from simple black and white light sensitive plates to black and white in color film to now digital. But what remains what's so exciting to me is that little bit of magic every single time that I develop a piece of film and get that image on it. But today and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about what got me into film photography in the first place. The science, or more specifically, the chemistry behind it. Since the first photograph was taken in 1826, people were captivated by its ability to capture the life around them. But even then, they wanted more. They wanted color. Now, if you're just interested in a little bit of background about film, go check out my previous video, um, which was more specific about black and white film and how to develop black and white film um, in the darkroom. And today, we are all about color and color photography. And this will be a two-part video today I'm gonna cover what are called additive color processes, and then we're gonna talk about subtractive color processes on Friday. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a second. But yeah, people wanted color. And this is a very complicated process that required a lot of people to all work on it, including scientists, photographers, and businessmen to come up with something scientifically sound, photographically accurate, and commercially successful. And the first step kind of included just basically people repainting black and white photographs and adding color in. So photographers would actually hire artists to come in and paint their photographs for them after the fact. Now, this is actually really cool and it results in some really cool artwork, but does it really count as color photography? Eh, I'm not too sure about that one. But to understand and crack the code behind color photography, we really needed to crack the code behind light. And in 1666, Sir Isaac Newton proved that using a prism, you could split white light into seven different colors. Um, but it wasn't until 1861 that James Clerk Maxwell, another physicist, proved that by combining red, green, and blue lights, you could make all of the colors you needed to for color photography. And this was really probably the big first step in using uh, the optics of light and the science of light in order to figure out how to make color photography. And then people began what are known as additive color processes, which is where they started trying to combine together red, green, and blue light to make color images. One of the first early color additive processes was something called a chromogram, and this was invented by a guy named Frederick Eugene Ives. And what he did is he actually took three of the same images in black and white, but each one was taken with a different color filter, a red filter, a blue filter, and a green filter. These images were then processed into negatives, turned into transparent positives, and then combined all together in a device called a, a chrome, like photochromatic graph or something like that and they were aligned together so they were all superimposed on top of each other and then re-put through a filter to all combine together that red green and blue light all combined together to make a color photograph and it worked it was really cool but as you could probably understand from my explanation it was also incredibly complicated and things that are incredibly complicated don't end up usually being commercially successful so the chromogram was not very long-lived and thus gave way to the Jolie process, which was discovered by Dr. John Jolie of Ireland. And he took a similar approach using different colored filters. But rather than take three separate images with different colored filters, he decided to combine those all onto one screen. So he made a filter that had red, green, and blue lines all on it. And then he took an image through that filter, processed it, and then put the image back through another filter and created a color photograph. This ended up being commercially successful for a couple of years, but it had a lot of color limitations to it. So people didn't really end up liking it in the overall scheme of things. And then we turn to another additive process, the autochrome. Now autochromes are really one of the like first commercially successful and like more easily manufactured coloring processes. And these were invented by two brothers, the Lumiere brothers, um, who of course lived in France based on, you know, the last name of Lumiere. Um, and they thought to themselves, hey, everybody has been um, basically like, here's the photographic emulsion or the film or the plate, and here's the filter. And they're two separate components. What if we put them together? So what they did is they actually took potato starch, teeny tiny granules of potato starch, and they dyed them red, green, and blue. And they applied them onto the plates, and then they applied a varnish, they applied charcoal powder to fill in any gaps, 
Then they applied the photographic emulsion to the plate and then they took a picture with it. And those tiny little dyed potato starch molecules or granules acted as that color filter. So then when it was processed and put back through a filter, you would get a color photograph and it was all in one photographic plate. Now due to the just kind of statistical randomness of putting different colors of potato starch granules onto a plate, sometimes you'd have little clusters of the same color put on the plate, which resulted in a very unique characteristic or artistic element to autochromes. I personally like looking at autochromes, think they're so cool um, and just look so good. Anyhow, so this is very popular and they're able to manufacture a lot of these plates. Um, but again, you would have a little bit of a different kind of artistic difference or a very characteristicness if you had those groupings of the starch molecules. Following the autochrome was the event of a variation upon the autochrome called Dufay color. And instead of using individual dyed starch granules, Dufay color actually used a mosaic of red, green, and blue lines and rectangles to create kind of a more standardized pattern to their backing of the film versus the random scattering of dye molecules in autochrome. And this was processed the same way. You took the photographic color filter and the photographic emulsion were on the same plate. You took a picture with it. Um, it actually developed a lot, or it was, you could take exposure times were a lot shorter with Dufay color, not quite the same as black and white film of the time, but still you could take pictures a lot faster or had a lot shorter exposure times and you ended up with color as well. And this actually remained commercially successful until about the 1950s and they even shot movies using Dufay color film. So that is all of the additive color processes that I'm going to talk about today. Remember additive being all of these processes combined red, green, and blue light together to create a colored image. Next time, we're going to talk about the history of subtractive color processes, which is what most color film uses today. Oh, I'm so excited. So stay tuned for that on Friday. Today's fun fact we're going to rate in the comments below on a scale of 1 to 10 is that Photography can win you a Nobel Prize too. In 1908, Gabriel Lippmann won the Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering a color photographic method that only relied on wave interference of light. So the physics of light could create color photographs. Really cool stuff. Ah, I'm sorry, I'm just so excited. I can't contain my excitement. So please rate that fun fact in the comments below. Like this video, subscribe to my channel, tell all your friends about it. Stay tuned for this kind of series about photography and cameras. Hopefully gonna get into building some cameras in a couple of weeks. It's gonna be super fun. See you all on Friday and keep it sciencey. Create a more, um, what's the word?